name again is Marjorie Freeman, and I'm with an organization called the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, which is a mouthful. Um, it started about 30 years ago. It was started by two African-American men. One was out of Ohio, Dr. Jim Dunn, who had gra graduated long before from the Columbia School of Social Work, and who was a teacher of African and African-American studies at Antioch College in Ohio. He teamed up with another man from New Orleans, whose name is, G is Ron Chisholm, who is, Ron Chisholm is still the executive director of the People's Institute. They had both been organizers. What I mean by that, they had been doing work in their communities. One of them, both of them had been working largely with people who were in public housing, people who were on welfare, people who were living with poverty. And they had studied a lot. They had studied with the greatest organizers, Saul Alinsky and Cy Khan and some of the greats that you, you know about or, or will know about. When, they t when the two of these men got together, the African American men got together, they started talking about the way in which they had been trained, as you're being trained, and they also talked about what was missing from their trainings. And what they said to one another, and it was the beginning of a conversation that's now lasted 30 years, they said, if you don't understand racism, in this country, and if you don't understand the history of how racism got put into place in this country, and if you don't understand the cultural ways in which people who've been oppressed by racism are able to survive generation after generation after generation, then you cannot be effective in the work that you think you're being effective at. And that's their premise. That's the premise of the People's Institute's work. We are an organization that started out with the name the People's Institute for Survival. And then the people in the community said, well, we know how to survive. We've been doing that all our lives. We need to go beyond survival. Hence the name, the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. We're headquartered in New Orleans, Louisiana. We have offices around the country, including New York. And we work here in the New York region with a group called the Anti-Racist Alliance. And I hope that each and every one of you will go to the website for the Anti-Racist Alliance and read about it and think about becoming part of that work that we're doing here. We are building a movement. The Anti-Racist Alliance was started here by social workers. It was started by people who are faculty, Jane Edwards being among them, and people who are students and people who are practitioners. And they said to us, the People's Institute, they said after they had been through our process of understanding what this thing of race and racism is, they said to us, we're not preparing our students to go out and work with people who live in oppressed communities. And then they added, and this was the big one, they said not only are we not preparing our students to do that, but we're not prepared to prepare them the faculty themselves, the staff, the administrators felt that they did not know what they needed to know in order to do this work effectively. So what they have started here, they started a, essentially a revolutionary process that started a few years ago that said, we are going to transform social work uh, education and practice. We are going to make it anti-racist. That word is not something that you hear on the 6 o'clock news, is it? You don't hear that word very often, at least I don't. It's a word that we use very intentionally because it means for us that it, it requires us to become reinvested in our own humanity and, and the humanity of others. That's what anti-racism means to us. What we know about racism and what you will learn if you take our, our training over some time, which we'll give you information about, is that racism is a construct. This, this country was constructed, right? We all know that. We all took civics, we all took U.S. history, or most of us did, and we know that this country was, was constructed. And race became a part of that construct. It's an arrangement. It's a way that this, this is in the DNA of this country. And if we don't know that, then we think that race has to do with how I feel about you and how you feel about me, which is a part of it. All of us may have feelings about people who come from different races. Isn't that true? 
We all have experiences, we all have attitudes, we all have all kinds of things that we think about people who look different from us, who speak a different language, who have a different way of life, a different cultural way of, of viewpoint. That is called race prejudice. I might be prejudiced in favor of some persons and against others, but that's just race prejudice. We all have it. But when it comes to this thing called racism, racism's an ideology, it's a structural arrangement, it has to do with power. And if we don't understand that, then what happens is that we get confused. So we start talking with each other, as if we're talking about the same thing. And one person's talking out of this experience, another person's talking out of this experience, and we miss each other. We can't get together to have conversations that are really authentic. And I always like to mention my, my good friend Donna Davis because years ago, many years ago when I was beginning to, under, I was like Columbus, I had just discovered racism. I was hot and I was gonna, by God, throw it down everybody's throat. And Donna was the one that said to me one time before we were gonna do some work with, around racism with the church that she and I both went to. She was an African-American woman out of Mississippi. I was a good, well-meaning, bright, progressive, revolutionary out of California, right? But I didn't know anything. And she said to me, she said, Marjorie, she said, do you really want to do this? In other words, do you really want to go and deal with racism with people who are African American and white and Latino all in the same room? And I said, of course, of course, naturally. And she said, well, she said, it's been my experience that in this country we have what I call a conspiracy of courtesy. Mm -hmm. A conspiracy of courtesy. We are very polite with one another, especially across racial lines. We are very careful. We don't speak about racism across racial lines. In communities of color, racism is, called, is talked about all the time. I know this from hearing it from people for generations. In the white community, most of, the mo most of us, maybe not all of us, but most of us, when we said something that may have identified something that was racial, our mamas and daddies went, shh, don't talk about it. It's not polite. Any of you had that experience? So what I want to do with you today is take you, uh, just to begin a process, a dialogue with you. Um, you are here as social work students because you care about people. Am I right? Is there anybody in here who doesn't care about people? Because <laughs> if you don't, then you're probably in the wrong profession, right? That's what brings us here. It's something inside of us. Some of us are coming in as second career people because this is really going to matter to us. A lot of us, how many of us in here think we're probably going to be working either directly with or on behalf of people who are poor? Raise your hand if, that, if you think that's what you're going to do. How many of us in here believe that we want to do something to make things fair, more, more equitable? Raise your hand if you think that. Is there anybody in the room that didn't raise your hand or should have raised your hand to one of those two questions? You know, it's sort of like a friend of mine said once to me, I, when my son was really sick, and... Um, he said, Marjorie, he says, you know, it's funny about racism. He said, here's your son, and he's really sick. He says, I care about your son, but it doesn't give me permission to go in and start operating on him, does it? We know that we've got to know something. He said, but when it comes to racism, we all have our own opinions, our own experiences, our own attitudes, our own fears, our own frustrations. But we all think we can go into communities of color and start operating on them without knowing what this thing is called racism. I want to just take a few minutes with you. If we are going to understand racism, which has to do with who's in charge of things, who benefits, and who doesn't benefit, we have got to understand the dynamics of power. And in the People's Institute, we have something that we call a power analysis. 
because if we don't understand the dynamics of power that control all of our lives, whether we're living in complete privilege and wealth or whether we're living in abject poverty, we're controlled by the structural arrangement. If we don't know that, who do we usually blame for their own condition? Who do we usually blame? Who? The victim, the people that are suffering the most. We finally get that. It comes down to it. It's very easy for us. If we go and we don't understand the arrangement within which people are living and trying to exist and trying to survive, we get frustrated and we finally say, well, they're just not about anything. Or, well, they're just lazy. Or, well, they're just whatever the just is that we happen to have as way, the way we speak. So for a minute, we're not going to blame the victims. We're not going to do anything. For a minute, in order to understand this dynamic of race and the structural nature of it, which is the only point I want to make here this afternoon in these few minutes that we have together, I want to, do a, I want to draw a picture with you. I want you to help me draw a picture. When you're walking, how many of you from Westchester County? How many of you from New York City? How many of you from Connecticut? Connecticut rules in this room. My goodness, I did that. Okay, if I were to go to Connecticut and I wanted to go down to a community in your, in your town that was poor, and I don't mean poor in spirit, I mean poor don't have enough money to live on poor, would I be able to drive up the highway, I-95 or whatever it is, and see a sign that said poor community, next exit? No, I wouldn't be able to see that, would I? But I'll bet, and this is what we're going to do right now, what I'd like you to do is think about the community where you live. And think about the poor community that's nearest the one where you live. Where you might drive through, you might see it on TV when somebody's being arrested, you might have lived there yourself, you might know people who live there, you might have visited it, what I want you to do is, in your own understanding, I want you to make a picture of that community. What are some of the... Fast foods. Fast food. A lot of fast food stores, right? What kind? What's a particular one that you can think of? McDonald's. 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 Mickey D's. McDonald's. Kentucky Fried Chicken. KFC. Yep. A lot of those. What else do you see? Peep Imagine. Shows. What it? Peep shows. Peep shows. A lot of peep shows. Adult bookstores. And peep shows. Peep. Do we have libraries in this neighborhood? Not likely, but we do have adult bookstores and peep shows. You're right. What else do we have? Community health centers. Community health centers. So we've got a community uh, health. Okay, what else do we have? Hookers. What did you say? Hookers. Hookers. Okay, I'll put a little something on one of these. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what else do we have? Shelters. Say, say that again? Lots of police. A substation, probably, which may or may not come to you when you need them or not. What, did, what was the other thing? I said shelters, homeless shelters, food, bank. Okay, shelters. What else? What kind of stores do we have? Yes? Storefront churches. Storefront churches. I was waiting for somebody to come up with that. Got a lot of them, don't we? Okay? Sometimes churches, uh, mosques, what else? Sometimes substance abuse centers. Sometimes those could be community health or, or substance abuse health. Uh, places, places where methadone is being given out, needle exchanges, a lot of different things. That's right. What else? Inexpensive stores. Like? Dollar stores. You bet. Dollar stores. There's so many different dollar stores, aren't there? Yes, in the back. That's what I was going to say. Okay, what else? Anybody else? Yes. Lots of homeless people. Let's make some of these people homeless. I don't know. How do you draw somebody who's homeless? They're just hanging out, right? Near the community health center, or something like that. Projects. The projects. You could put a project right here. Let's uh, let's put a high rise project and make it into something that's one of the big cities. But in smaller towns, they're often just neighborhoods, aren't they? Where there's a lot of housing. So it varies a lot. But there's often some kind of project. I'm 54, so they used to call them projects. They sure did. They still and they kids. People still speak of the bricks, the jets, whatever they call them. There's a lot of names for it. Yes. Empty lots. A lot of empty lots, right? It might have been something, and if it were, a, if it had been sort of originally a playground, would there be much on it? 
It's mostly just junk, right? Maybe a maybe a basketball hoop with a what do people use now to put up for a basketball hoop? What kind of things do they use? Crates. Milk crates. A lot of things, right? What kind of yes? Also, it's just like there's like industrial factories. Good, 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 good point. There's a lot of factories. There might be a big factory up here that's spewing all kind of stuff, toxic stuff, right? Or if it were New York City, it was where I live in the Bronx, it might be a, a MTA station where all they where they park all the all the uh, trains or the buses or something like that. That's good. What kind of what kind of highway? What would, what might be the name of this main highway through here? How do you know you're in the MLK? MLK, you got it. MLK is going to be in the heart. So if you see the sign for MLK, either you're saying to yourself, "Come home." Or you're saying to yourself, oh, oh, I'm lost. But you know it's going through this community. And that's true across the country. What billboards might you see here? Beer. Beer, okay. A beer, a beer with what kind of beer are we talking about? Usually a malt 40 or maybe yeah. some, could be something fancier too. Depends. What about graffiti? A lot of graffiti. A lot of graffiti on all these buildings. A lot of graffiti on the police. All these, all these buildings have this. Lots of these. Anything else? You may see a sign that say "Welcome to the Weed and Seed Community." Where they try to weed and Seed, them. one of the social services communities. Okay, we'll put down here. We'll put down a social Weed and Seed. Does everybody know what that means? It's one of the many efforts to try to address some of the issues in this community. This is a pretty interesting. Yes. We have a couple of churches, we'll put a couple more, because we need a lot of churches in this community. Sometimes they're mosques, sometimes they're storefronts of all different types, aren't they? I'm seeing a lot of pollution, like on the floor, you see a lot of like cigarette butts. A lot of junk all over the floor, right? Here's a person trying to step over all that junk. You like my right drawings, right? I, I, somebody told me when they saw this, they said, you better keep your day job, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> the roads are also very... The roads are a mess, and they're really full of potholes. I'm not going to be able to do that, but I agree. They're all potholes. What is one of the main features of a community like this, in addition to bad roads and a main Martin Luther King? What other thing? How about thing? habitat for community? Okay, habitat's up here. Habitat is going to rehab this habitat. Okay, but what you also have is you have the interstate. I-95 or whatever the interstate is, is going to go right through that community. Yes? Wherever there's a public school, it's really run down. It's run down. And what else is about it that you remember? There are bars on the windows. There are bars on the windows. You've got a little flag up here. But it is definitely barred up and looking like a person. Hmm. Hmm. Yes? There's no trees. No trees. No. The trees were cut down in this little park. There might have been a couple of little scrubby bushes next to it, but not a whole lot. That's right. How many of us have seen a community that looks like this? Raise your hand high so I can make sure. Is there anybody in here who might not have seen a community like that? Now, in this community lives Mrs. Johnson, Mr. Jackson, Ms. Gonzalez, Ms. Chang. These are people raising their kids. They are going to school, they are holding jobs, usually more than one. They are making it by the hardest, aren't they? They are making it by the hardest. What I want to do right now, this is a community that a friend of ours, a colleague of mine, has called a franchise. He says, you can go anywhere in this country. Big city, small town, north, south, east, or west, mountains or, or plains, desert, on the coast. And it looks just like this. It can be an African American community. It can be a Latino community. It can be an Asian American community. It can be a Native American community. It can be a white community. It is a community that looks this way because it's poor. And many of you, as I understand it, will probably be working on behalf of people who live in this community. You'll be working on behalf of Ms. Jackson, Mr. Jackson, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Gonzalez, Mr. Chen. Is that right? Is that right? That most of the work that we do as social service people, as social workers, is either going over here to this school to work, going over here to the health clinic, 
going over here to Habitat, going to the Weed and Seed Program, maybe working in some measure with the high rise, with the housing department. So what we want to do for a minute, I want you to think about, if these are folks who are living in here and surviving by the hardest, it's a hard existence in many ways, but it is also a place that's filled with life. There is a huge amount of life in here. In fact, often, those of us who don't live in this community will go in there for a meal or for music because we are, there's, there's things that are going on there that are, that are happening, that are culturally relevant to this community and keeping this community surviving. It's the culture of the community that enables it to survive. Yes? I was going to say, some of us personally Absolutely. Have family there. You know there's a lot of love here. There's a lot of effort here. There's a lot of persistence here. We know that. And we don't want, if we're, if we're not knowing that, then we will often say, oh, well, those people, as we drive by. So we have to be very conscious of the life that goes on there. We have to be very conscious that despite the stuff that makes this community look like it is that you all could name. Despite that, there's a huge amount of, of life going on here. Now, this is what I want you to do. Mrs. Johnson and Mr. Jackson and Ms. Chang and Ms. Gonzalez have to deal with systems, institutional systems, lots of them. All of us have to deal with systems. But we're talking about this particular community. What I want you to do, when Ms. Gonzalez gets up in the morning, she has her little three-year-old, she's taking her to school, to the Head Start program, she's got a mama that's got to go to the doctor, she's got to get to work on time, and then she's got to go to her second job. What are the systems and institutions that this community is dealing with that feel as if they are oppressive, even if they are not intended to be? but feel that way to that community. Name the systems that feel oppressive to it. Yes? The healthcare system. Healthcare. Social service. Social service. Law enforcement. Law enforcement. Oops, enforcement. What else? Education. Education. It's hard to say these sometimes. What else? Departments that deals with ours and Department Say it again. In Connecticut's Department of Children and Families. Department of Children and Families. See the Child Protective Services system. Right. What else? Look at this picture you've drawn. What other systems do you see here? Think about it. Yes. Public works. The public world. works. Public works. Did you also say wor uh, roads? Basically, roads. So transportation, water. maybe. Who, who fixes those potholes? Who makes sure that the water is safe? What else? Housing. Housing, absolutely. Housing. And I'm not saying just public housing. This is not about just public. It's public and private housing, isn't it? What else? What other systems are this, as this person, when she wakes up in the morning, what does she have to do first? What does she want to do first? What does she usually do first? Child care system. She has child care, so the child care system. What else? cultural. What a kind of thing. What are you thinking about? What uh, systems, What? where does culture fit into? Divide uh, it up. Think about what you mean by that. As far as what their place is within their own culture, and some cultures want you to stay a certain way and other cultures want you to succeed. That's true. That's absolutely wonderful. But what we're talking about right now is the systems, the actual systems external to that cultural arrangement there that bears down on it. Think about it. Environmental. Protection. Environmental protection. I'll put EPA because we've got this plant up here that's real close, don't we? Or whatever else is going on. What else? The church can be a system. Church, religious system. Substance abuse. Substance abuse. What I'm going to call substance abuse is I'm going to call it drugs. The drug system or the pharmaceutical. How about alcohol? That's good, but the, the, just for a second, drugs is both legal and illegal, aren't we talking both, right? Yeah. Alcohol, who's controlling the alcohol system? Who, what public institution does? What federal agency? 
What's it called? ATF. What does ATF stand for? Alcohol, firearms. Alcohol, tobacco, tobacco fire. and firearms. Hmm. Interesting how those three go together, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we're selling that substance in what? what? Where are we selling it? We put them up here. The first thing we put up here was what? And which is part of what system? Well, it could be local government. That's a good one. But what is, who's running this store? Government. It's a store, right? Which is part of the what kind of system? Capital. Capital system or the retail? Retail corporate system. Running all these little stores and, and things. This what about little dollar store. Like the banking system. Yes, absolutely. Banking. Banking and finance. Because how are these folks getting loans or not? Right. What else? Any others you can think of right off the bat? Pam? Employment, unemployment. We've got a lot of business around that right now, don't we? Employment, unemployment. What about social, um, social security services? That's right. And that would be coming under the, the whole rubric of all the different federal, state, locals, what we would call public um, okay. Welfare system, there's a lot more to it than that, too, but that's a good one. Or a social security system, that's right. Anything else? Yes? The, uh, the for the military, and military. big system. Is the is a military have a big presence in this community? Yes. Yeah. Huge, mm -hmm. huge, enormous, yes. Gangs and organized crime. The criminal system, which was, we'll just put down here gangs, because we've got a whole lot of varieties of those, and sometimes they're very, very, very well organized and running things, and sometimes they're much less so. But we'll put it down there as a system, because it has its place, doesn't it? Yeah, that's good. Any other? Any other that you could think of? Yes? The justice system. The criminal justice system. We put down law enforcement, but the whole criminal justice system, which would include what? Criminal justice could be the courts, the prisons, the jails, the ways in which, you know, bail bonds and all of that. Huge system, isn't it? Now, when you woke up this morning, did you turn something on? I'm not Media. talking, personally. Did you turn on something? What did you turn on? The news, which is part of what system? Interesting that we didn't say that, but it's really a profound impact, doesn't it? Legal aid would be probably part of law enforcement, legal aid. The whole system around that, absolutely. So I want to just stop here now. You could add to that insurance, for example, gaming. You could add um, sports and entertainment. There are a lot of other systems, too. But you've named transportation. I think we put up there, didn't we? Yes. This is an arrangement. This is what poverty looks like worldwide in many ways. In this country, in this state, in this region, in this country as a whole, one of the things we know about this arrangement is that even as these are often felt by the people living here as feet of oppression, you know, somebody's got a foot on your neck, you know what I mean? It feels like a foot. You can't get out from under it. It's just too much. Every one of these institutions is a place of employment. Is that right? Do most of us want to get jobs? Anybody in here doesn't want to get a job? So we are going to be inside of these systems, aren't we? We have to understand not only the relationship of these systems to this community, we have to understand our role and responsibility as we look and work in these systems. If we don't understand this systemic arrangement, we are not being prepared to end poverty. That is not our job. We might think that's what our job is, but our job is not to do that. Our job, this is a cash cow 
for these institutions. Every one of these institutions and systems depends on people being poor. Is that fair to say? You understand what I'm saying about that? So even I have the most marvelous intent to help the people in here. I really want to help them. But my job, my job is actually that which we call gatekeeping, which is like a pressure cooker. It's like the person who helps to keep things from exploding. It's a very, very delicate job that we all have when we go to work. Whether we go to work at, we didn't put up the universities, did we? Woo! <laughs> They're kind of the poor system, it's sort of the system of all systems. So we have to understand this dynamic of arrangement that people in these systems out here benefit from communities that are poor. Does that make any sense to you all? Does it? Okay. Now here's the last thing I'm going to talk to you about today. Because this is really where we really start talking about race and racism. In the United States, in the United States, when this country was being formed, there were a whole lot of people who were poor. A lot more people who were poor than those handful of folks who were setting up colonies in this country, right? The colonies were just like one person, some English man, he had to be Protestant, and he went in to, let's say, Virginia, and he put his stake down, and he said, I'm gonna claim this land for whom? Who did he claim it for? Yeah, in the name of whom, though? Or, in fact, it was named Jamestown because who was king? Okay, so we know that these were people that were going with the authority and the power to claim a piece of land. Whose land? Yeah, some other people were there, weren't they? Some other people were there, but they went and they claimed that land. And they wanted to build their own wealth. That was their job. They wanted to build wealth and build wealth for England. This is way, way back now. We're talking in the 17th century. But if you're going to build wealth, and you've got a piece of land that you've taken from somebody else, what do you need? What do you need to build wealth? Labor. Yay, labor. So where are you going to get your labor? The people, there. the people there. The trouble is, what happens? People there try to do what they want them to do, and then what do they do when they don't want to be there anymore? They leave, because they can find their way around better than that English man who wants to build wealth with the labor of the Indians. Even better, basically, you have the military might, and then they make the people the slaves. That's right, and you just jumped a couple of decades down the pike, but that's exactly what happened. We, brought, we went back in order to get labor, because the Indians were not very good at this. We went back to England. That man went back to England, and where did he get labor in England? Anybody know? Dentured well, servants, people who were criminals. He went to, to work off well, they were debt. not necessarily criminals. He went to debt. the prisons, didn't he? Yes. And who debtors. were mostly in those prisons? Debtors. Prisons. Debtors. Yes. They were debtors prisons. In other words, you went to jail because you were poor. Does it sound a little bit familiar to us? So he went and he got those debtors, and he promised them, he said, I will pay your passage. I will bring you to this new land. You work for me for how many years? Masamana, seven years. And you will be free of your debt. And you will have a new stake in the society. Well, that worked. That was pretty good. But then what they decided to do is that they, had to, they emptied out the jails in England and Scotland and France and the Netherlands and all over the place. But they also started bringing people from where? Africa. They started bringing people from Africa. Were those people being asked whether they wanted to come? No, they were being stolen, they were being captured, kidnapped, put onto ships, most of whom died on the middle passage, as it was called, and they were brought over. They were also made into indentured servants for a while. Now, this is the thing. This is the story. If you are living, let's say this is Jamestown. You don't have all these systems yet, but you do have the military. You sure enough have the military. 
keeping things right. And you're trying to get your corporate work going. You're getting a little bit of banking. You're getting a little bit of government. So you're starting to create a systemic an arrangement, right? Here you've got an English man, and he's working next to an African man, and they're both in the, the working for nothing, and they're working for this big man, right? They're out in the fields. They are really being worked to death, because one of the things that that owner is counting on is not having to pay off his debt, the debt. That he is expecting to work that person to death so he doesn't have, they don't have to pay it off. So, if I'm out there working, being worked to death, and somebody else is out there being working to death, what might we do together? Conspire. What? Conspire. Conspire to do what? To Revolt. overthrow the system. To overthrow or run away or somehow get out of there, right? Now, this is what I want you to understand. They were there. Let's pretend, let's just say this is a field here. They go running off. They go running off to the Native American people who are already pissed off at that English owner, aren't they? Because they, they had had their lands taken. They go running off. But when they're captured, what happens by law in this country is very important for you to understand in the 21st century. Because what they did, by law, is they said, okay, Mr. English worker, we're going to add three years to your sentence. You did a bad thing by running off or by revolting. We're going to add three years to your service. You have to work three more years. And they said to the African men, you are going to have lifetime servitude. What does that mean? Slavery. The enslavement process was beginning legally. It's not that it was the first time there had been slaves, but it was the Africans in this country who were being told that they were going to become lifetime ser servants, which meant enslaved people. Now, the next time this English worker, who had three years added to her sentence, the next time the man from Africa comes over and wants to conspire with this other man to run off together, this man has nothing to lose, does he? He's got lifetime servitude. He's enslaved. This person has what? Three years. Three years. So even though they are in the same situation, what does this person say to him when he asks him to run off with him? He says, I love you, but you're on your own. Right? That is because the legal system that was emerging in this country, the legal system that got put into place over the next 200 years would make sure that the laws that were passed that favored people that would come to be called white, right now they're not white, they're just English or Protestant or Christian or something else, they're not even white yet. They don't get to be white till the end of the 17th century. By law. Mis don't misunderstand me. This is legal stuff we're talking about. So what happens is that a legal system gets put into place that says people called white, people who come to become white, will be able to become citizens. The first law passed by the new constitution in 1790 in this country is a law that says who can become a citizen and it says only white people can become citizens. It was very clear. The founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, all of these folks who we revere as icons in history, they all understood that this was going to be created as a nation that was going to favor people who call, were called white. That is the law, white by law. I have all the, you can read about it if you want to, but that's how the law got put into place. So even when the Constitution was written, remember what happened in the Constitution? Some of you might remember. There was a, you all took civics and you all had to take that multiple cho choice qu uh, question. You know, what was the three-fifths clause in the Constitution? Anybody remember that? Yeah. Um, uh, an African-American was only three-fifths of a person. Why? Huh? Do you remember why? Uh, no, I don't remember. 
Well, that's good because that's exactly what it was true. We said in the Constitution that Negroes, as they were then called, were going to be counted as three-fifths of a human being for purposes of taxation and representation. It was a power, always about power. The South, with all of its thousands of people who were enslaved Africans, wanted to have more power. The only way they could get them was to take what they had been calling real estate, i.e. slaves, and make them people in order to be counted. The North didn't want them to be counted because the North said, if you count them all, you were counting them on real estate along with all of your property before, and now you want them to be called as, counted as people so you can have more power? That's not fair. So they had to have something like we're doing today with the health care. They had to have a debate and discussion, right? So they had a debate and discussion and made three, made the Negroes three-fifths of a human being for purposes of taxation and representation only. Not because they could vote or own land or vote before the courts or get married or anything else, but for purposes of taxation and representation. Now, Indians were still there, weren't they? And getting more pissed off, right? What were the Indian status in the Constitution? Anybody know? They weren't recognized, they weren't recognized at all. Indians, comma, not taxed. They weren't going to be there. The only good Indian is a? How do we know that? How do we know that? The only good Indian is a dead Indian. It's an expression that's in our bones of this country. It's in the nation's bones. So fast forward to this arrangement. You have a country that was founded on a premise that said white is going to be the model of humanity. All other people are not going to be part of the social contract. Only white people can become citizens. Nobody else can do this. And that was debated over hundreds of years, debated and discussed and debated and discussed. Some people got to be in, some people got to be in, more people got to be in, and finally, in 1952, that law was taken over. 1952. How many years is that? Look at that. 1790? 1952? How many years is that? Huh? Century and a half, more than a century and a half. The country was constructed, the construction of the society was based on something called white supremacy. We think that white supremacists are just those crazies, clans people and, and Minutemen and nuts that go off and run around in the woods up in the northern Idaho. I hope nobody hears from Idaho. <laughs> but that is not the case. This country was built on that. What you need to understand, and I'm going to stop in a few minutes, what I would want you to understand is that as you have communities that are poor, and still could be any, any group. It could be a white community or black community or anybody else. But the purpose of this country was to make sure that every one of these institutions was created to benefit people who look like me. That's their purpose. And even 40 years after our civil rights movement, after the revolution of, that we've tried to have to change things, this is held together. This entire structure was put into place and it's held together by something called racism. It's held together by that. The nature of this society, much as we love it, much as we believe it's got enormous values, and we have all the things that we tr tr treasure about this country, that we, ne we must know, we must know that this country was created by and for people who came to be called white. Now that doesn't make me a bad person in 2010. What it does, it makes me part of a collective history. I am not just a nice white lady. I can't be just a part of this nice white lady thing because I am benefiting all the time from every one of these institutions. You know, it's funny, Malcolm X once said, he said, you know, a chicken can't lay a duck egg. A chicken can't lay a duck egg. 
In other words, a system set up to benefit people who were white because that was what the ideology, this is an ideology, that's what that is. The ideology said that whites were better. Every one of these systems was set up to benefit people who were called white. Every single other person, all the way from the early, the beginning of the Constitution, the beginning of the 19th century on, every other group had to fight for the right to be even allowed into these systems. But these systems are, they're rooted in this notion. They are rooted in that systemic arrangement that was put into place at the birth of this country. And what Malcolm X said, that if a chicken did lay a duck, in other words, if a system did change, it would have to be one revolutionary system, chicken. And what he meant by that is that you can't just expect the systems of child protective services, the systems of education, the systems of religion, the systems of government, the systems of transportation, media, you can't expect these systems to suddenly change. What happened in the 1960s is that we had a revolutionary activity that was brought about by the work of thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people, black people, brown people, Asian people, Indian people, white people, working together to say, this is wrong. This should not be so because this has been legal. This has been legal from 1619 right up to 1967. It's been a legal system that's benefiting me and mine and working to disadvantage the people who we call people of color. Well, you know, you've been saying white. Yeah. Women have been undergoing the same thing, the right to vote, the right, the right to work, That's right. the right to make That's people right. pay. That's so right. that there's been a revolution been, that has That's been going true. on. And it's a, good, it's, a good, it's a good parallel, except, except for the fact that women were always allowed to benefit from the status of being drunk. They were not poor or they were not oppressed because of the color of their skin. They were oppressed because of other things. But their poverty didn't result from their being white. And their status changed, just like the status of people of color has changed. You're absolutely right. But what I'm trying to point out is this, and I'll you know, ask you a question. When you have a system that's been put into place, like this, and you have people functioning in these systems based on an ideology that has said for hundreds of years that white is better than. If you have that ideology embedded into this arrangement, what are the outcomes that we're living with today? Who's in prison? Who's in prison? You know, don't you? Black men. That's right. The majority of the New York State prisons 85% of the people in prison in upstate New York come from six zip codes in New York City. When we talked about the three-fifths clause where Negroes were treated as three-fifths of human beings for purposes of taxation and representation, today in upstate New York, the people who are in those prisons there, do you know where they're counted for purposes of taxation and representation? Where are they counted? Anybody know? right where they're in prison. So that the people living in the prison, the people in prison are being countered to give power to the place where the prisons are. Disempowering the places where they're from. It's true in Connecticut, it's true in New Jersey, it's true across the country. So the notion of a three-fifths person is not so remote as you might think it is. So what I want you to understand just quickly if we don't understand this arrangement, and we don't understand that racism is about power, it's about how people who set this country in place wanted to keep it 
a, keep an arrangement in place that would allow them to keep in power. If we don't un understand that, then we can't have authentic relationships. We can't build conversations with people who live here. We can't begin to have this kind of, we can't be good therapists. We can't be good social workers. We can't be effective in the work that we do in these institutions until and unless we understand this arrangement. Why it got put into place and how it got put into place. This is not supposed to make us feel bad. This is supposed to make us angry. Because the results are, as you know, in Child Protective Services, for example, most of the children, disproportionately, the children in Child Protective Services are what? What race? Black. They are black. They are the, disproportionate to their numbers. They're overwhelmingly of color. The reason they are is because we have some unexamined attitudes and feelings about things that make it hard for us to change. So if we don't understand this, we're not going to change. So, I think that if you want to understand this, we would be delighted to have you come to any one of our workshops. We have them regularly. We will have, be having one at Fordham here in March. They are called Undoing Racism slash Community Organizing Workshops. We call them Undoing Racism because this has been done. This is not God-ordained. It's not scientific. It was done. It's a socio-political arrangement, and so we can undo it. And we can undo it if we understand it. Do you all have any questions before we wrap up? You've been a very patient and attentive group. For the end of the day, I just want to say blessings on all of you. But does anybody have anything, a particular question that you want to ask or a comment you want to make? You don't have to agree with me, but we would love to have you participate with us and join this movement, which we call anti-racism, because we want to create equity. We want to make these systems work on behalf of everybody. And while they're illegal, they are not gone. So we want to just invite you to be part of that movement if you would like. And thank you very much for having me.